Well, I hope everybody is kind of settling in after the new year, maybe the holidays. Anyone still kind of feeling the kind of the hustle and bustle and still feeling the drag of the holidays? <laughs> the drag is a bad word. One honest hand in the room. All right. I'm still feeling it. All right. We, we, we had a jam-packed holiday season ourselves. Um, before Christmas started, we had family come in town from, from Texas. Sarah's side of the family came and visited us. And so her sister was here with her husband and, and kids. And it was a fun time. We had those three Christmas Eve services, two in the morning and the one in the afternoon. And then we had Christmas morning. We woke up and we opened presents. And we, uh, then we decided to drive to the snow. All right. And so we went to uh, Santiam Pass. I said it last service, Santiam Pass. And they're like, Santiam Pass. All right. California boys still getting uh, settled into Oregon, right? But Santee Am Pass, all right? And some people, when we told them we were going to that pass, they're like, that's not real snow. And I said, we're bringing people from Texas to the snow. So that is real snow for them. We drove off the side of the road, found a little, like probably someone's property. We're not really sure yet. And we decided to play for a couple hours in the snow. What seemed like a couple hours, probably only like an hour or something like that. But took our boys and, and again, people from Texas seeing actual snow, not just pictures of it, was really fun. I took my oldest son. We walked down this long, uh, probably a driveway. I don't know. No one was there. And we kept going. And eventually, like, the track stopped. And he's like, Dad, can I keep going? And I was like, yeah, sure, keep going. And he started going off. And I couldn't see him anymore. And then I said, you know what? I want to stay married. So come back, come back. And he finally, about 10 minutes later, came back and I had to like threaten him to take away some presents and stuff like that. You guys, you've done that, right? No? Okay. Anyway, he came back and then we went and we had a great time. Um, but driving up to the snow was filled with driving with kids in the snow and all that comes with that. It was a really fun, um, interesting drive up. Came back. Um, family there stayed until I think it was Tuesday and then we left Tuesday the day after Christmas, and we got in the car and we drove down to Medford. I had like a free night worth of points at a hotel. And for the kids, they love spending the night at a hotel, all right? And I don't know why, because every time we go, they get the pull-out bed, all right? Who loves sleeping on a pull-out bed, all right? The sofa bed. Nobody does, all right? Not even last service. No one was like, oh, yeah, I'll just raise my hand. The preacher's asking to raise their hand. No, no one likes sleeping on a pull-out mattress, except for if you're my kids, Staying at a hotel in Medford, Oregon. It was the coolest thing ever, right? So we checked into the hotel. We stayed one night. It's kind of one of those trips where you're trying to get out of the house on time so you don't talk. Husband and wife don't talk the whole drive down until you get there. And then you're like, I love you. I love you too. Merry Christmas. And then you're, you're excited to, to spend time together. Um, then the next morning we drove five hours, got a chance to spend... Uh, our second Christmas with my parents, all right, so my mom and dad, and it was cool because my dad's kind of celebrating Christmas. He's like, this is one of his, the new Christmases for him going forward since everything that happened with him, and so it was fun to see him. I think I, I've said this before, but he's, again, he's doing physical therapy. He's, he's driving. His, we originally thought hopefully his personality won't come back. His personality is back, and I love it because he and my wife go at it all the time. It's pretty funny to watch them do that, give each other a hard time. But it was, it was a great time. We had our second Christmas there. And then after a couple days later, we, we drove to Nevada um, to go see my sister and her husband and her sons. And it was interesting, as we get in the car to drive there, all of a sudden we find out that there's or the road to Nevada, the highway is closed under police investigation. I thought, is there a murder suspect on the loose? Um, that's where your pastor's mind goes to when he hears that. Apparently there was a suspicious bag left on the side of the road or something like that. It's just weird. But that suspicious bag added another hour and a half on to a two-hour drive. Oh, don't say, uh, I gave him Dramamine. It was great. <laughs> the extra drowsy formula, which I found out I should have bought that one. But anyway, they were like <sighs> sleeping in the bag, heads banging against the windows. And it was a great drive. It was just me. My wife was sleeping. I didn't give her it. She took her own. And then the two kids in the back. <laughs> and I'm just driving. I was like, this is a great drive, everyone. There's an awesome highway going up to Nevada, and it's, it's Highway 88, and it's really, like, not the one we wanted to go, but it's Highway 88, and there's, it's like a ridge road that falls all the way up, and so there's amazing landscapes, seeing these beautiful mountains covered in snow, and then when the fog would break, you could see lakes, and it was amazing. But we drove to hang out with some other side of the family, my sister's side. And so we had our third Christmas there with, with um, our nephews and, and my sister and her husband. And we spent some time there. And you can imagine having a five-year-old staying up till midnight, all right, like three nights in a row, not just for New Year's Eve, but for every single night we're there. And then the cookies that my sister goes, yeah, auntie says have another cookie. And I'm like, I love, my, I love your auntie. 
Um, so we then, you know, gave him Dramamine for eight hours on the last day. <laughs> no, not on that day, but we had a lot of fun. Um, it was a good week for me because all of my football teams won, all right? Just, just to let you go. Yeah, thanks for cheering. We all knew the Niners were going to win. That's not, that's not the question. But the Ducks won. That was cool. I'm starting to cheer for them now, all right? Then the Niners won. And then I like Michigan. I'm sorry, Booker, Alabama lost. But, but I like Michigan. They won. So it was a good... I'm a football. Our family's a football family. At least I'm making them a football family. My sister, her and her boys are basketball family for sure. They love all sports. But my nephew, like, scored 39 points in a basketball game in a losing effort. I'm like, wow, you're, you're awesome. You just can shoot from, like, way downtown, like, from another city away making it. Anyway, we had a good time, but... With all of the hustle and bustle, we drove back on a Tuesday night to school to start Wednesday morning. God loves us so much that we're able to get them, get our kids off to school with a lunch fully made. That's about it. We've been playing catch up. So I don't know if you're like me, you've been playing catch up for the last few days, but that, that's what we're at. I'm tired. It's not an excuse. It's just reality. But hopefully that espresso is going to kick in any second now and we will start. Someone told me, you should tell us more stories about your family because we need to connect with you because I've only been here for like a little over three years now. So it's always good to drop those in. I realize I've just spoken at about 100 miles an hour. I'm going to slow down. In order to slow down, a good pastor will say, let's pray. So let's pray. God, we thank you so much for who you are. And God, we thank you for this new year and the new beginnings that you bring us. It symbolizes a new beginning for us. Lord, we know that if we are in you, we are a new creation. That's what your word tells us. And so we're going to believe that today. Give us the courage and strength to live out a life in new creation as a new person made new. Let us forget the old because the old is gone and the new has come. Let us live into that reality in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Today we are going to start a new series and I'm going to start it by reading the first sentence of the first book of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Amen. So we're going to do a, sermon, a series of sermons in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, the very first book in your Bible. So if you're new to your Bibles, today is great. It's really on the first page, all right? So if you look at your table of contents, just go one more page or maybe a couple of copyrights and all that. But you'll find Genesis chapter 1. It's pretty easy to find. Probably the easiest book in the Bible to find because it's the first one. We're titling this sermon series, Creation to Chaos. As you'll find, the story from Genesis 1 starts in creation and ends in chaos. And so why would we do that to start the year? I'm glad you asked, all right? One of the reasons why is we want to be in sync with our kids' ministry. One of the things we did this year is we were trying to, to follow what the kids are doing, and the kids are trying to follow what we're doing here, because the kids, they don't get dropped off for daycare on Sunday morning. They get discipled. They get trained. They get taught the Word of God and Scriptures. They get taught how to live a life that follows after Jesus. And so they're going to spend the first part of this year looking at Genesis 1 through 11 as well. So we're doing that as well. So for this service, which a lot of us have kids in our kids ministry, you can be talking about the same things after service. Another reason why we're doing this first 11 books of the Bible is because the rest of the Bible assumes that we know the stories found in Genesis 1 through 11. In fact, some scholars will say that Genesis 1 through 11 should be treated as the first half of the Bible. And then the second half of the Bible would then be Genesis chapter 12 all the way through Revelation chapter 21. First half and second half. All of the stories that take place from Genesis 12 on, they all assume that we know, as a readers, that we know what goes on in the first half of the Bible, the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Now, if we just spend all of our time reading the New Testament, kind of picking around and, and never going back to the first 11 verses, it's kind of like jumping into the middle of a movie, maybe 30 or 40 minutes into the movie. Now, my wife hates it when I do this, but sometimes I like doing it on purpose, but I'll just kind of come into a show that she's watching and I'll just start asking a bunch of questions. Like, oh, cringe already, all right? As my nephew said, that's, that's man cringe right there. I don't know, he's Gen Z, I'll, I'll learn it someday. But anyway, I'll just go, hey, like how... How did that guy get there? Or why is that guy 
why does he like her? And she's like, stop talking during the movie or the show. And I'm like, I just need to know. She doesn't, now you know that's why I do it, honey, just to jump in and ask questions, right? How many of you love when someone speaks or talks during a movie? No, okay, I do. If you want to go watch a movie together, we'll just talk the whole time. It'd be great. <laughs> Imagine jumping into Star Wars, the whole like saga at like Return of the Jedi and being like, man, this guy's got a lot of daddy issues and why does he have a metal hand and what's that sword that goes zoom, zoom, zoom? Like, why is he called a light? And what's this force? And there's a green guy with big ears talking to him, right? If you don't know Star Wars, I don't know where you've been since 1977, all right? Even I know, and I'm, I'm you know, 84 was born. But anyway, jumping into the middle, maybe differently, right? Said differently. If you jump into the middle of a book, right? 100 pages into a 200-page novel, like, there's a lot of catching up you got to do. And so that's why we're going to go back to this first 11 chapters. I think ultimately these stories help us to understand the reality in which we find ourselves. These stories give us answers to the questions that every culture asks. Every group of people will ask these questions. What is reality or what is really real out there? That's a question that every culture asks. What is really real? Now, if our answer is God, which as Christians, our answer should be God. He is the thing that is or the person who is really real. He is the real one. Then we have to ask the question, well, what kind of God are we talking about? What's the nature of this God? That question, those questions will be answered in the next seven weeks. What about what is the nature of the world around us? Why do we live here? What, what's going on? What is the, the nature of this reality? What is it like to live here in this place, on this earth? What is the nature of human beings, or what is a human being? There's so much confusion around the question of what is a human being, but we've all asked that question. What is a human? What does it mean to be human? Maybe you've heard of the question, what is a woman? That keeps going around a lot in culture nowadays, but they're asking this question, this fundamental question. What does it mean to be human? How do we know right and wrong? It's another question that all, every culture will ask. How do we know that? What is the meaning of human history? What, is, what, what has happened before? What, what's the meaning of everything that's gone before and, and where are we going into the future? Again, we're going to address all these questions because they're all addressed in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Because those chapters help us make sense of who we are, where we find ourselves, and where we are going. I like the way Pastor Daryl Johnson says, he says it better than I could ever say it, but he says Genesis 1 through 11 is the story that makes sense of our stories. So wouldn't it be good to have a little bit of sense for our stories and where we live and how we move and operate and have our being here? Well, that's what we're going to do from creation to chaos. So as we begin our study of this creation to chaos, we're going to go all the way back to the beginning, Genesis chapter 1. Now to give you some framework as we approach this text today, Genesis 1 is a song or it's a poetic in nature, all right? It's not a philosophical essay although there are philosophical implications. It's also not a biological thesis, although there are scientific and biological implications from the text. Genesis is a song. It was written with a proclamation. It's saying something amazing. It's giving us news to grapple with or to wrestle with. So it's a liturgy that beckons us to sing the tune. Now, I can't sing. I've told you that many times, and I'm not going to sing to prove it. I will sing occasionally, but I just am not really good. Someone in the room says I'm tone deaf. I don't even know what that means. I think I sound great every time. I think I hit my own keys, all right? I am just so amazing. I can sing my own tunes, right? No one's ever heard of them before. All right. Anyway, it's a song, but I think it wants us to sing it. And I wish every human being would know this song, know how to sing the song, we're all trying to sing the song of life, and I wish people would know how to sing it. I wish every child in the world would be able to see this song and to know exactly what took place and what is going on and know the creator who's behind the creation that we experience. So I'm going to read Genesis chapter 1, 
verses 1 through chapter 2, verse 3. And yes, it's going to take a few minutes, so bear with me. I'm not going to sing it for your sake and for mine. I'm going to chapter 2, verse 3, because I know a lot of you know this, but in case you didn't, the Bible wasn't written with these big numbers and these little numbers. We didn't originally have chapter numbers, and we didn't originally have verse numbers. It was a way to, they were added as a way to help us find passages quicker. So if you look at it, it should end at chapter 2, verse 3. That should be the whole beginning section, and then it would go into the next story. So let's listen, or you can read along with me. I'm reading from the the TNIV. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening. And there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate the water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called this vault sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds, and it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate the light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with which the water teems according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them. And said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food and to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it. I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw that it was, saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus, 
The heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. And by the seventh day, God had finished the work he'd been doing. So on the seventh day, he stopped from all of his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, he stopped from all the work of creating that he had done. Amen. Amen. It was only three minutes. It wasn't that bad. <laughs> Let's pray. God, we just thank you for this text and we thank you for the, for the amazing song that that can be sung in our hearts. Lord, we ask that you would open our ears to hear what you would say. Give us the eyes to see what to do with it. Give us the courage and strength to live it out. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So today, we're not going to go verse by verse through it. We're going to kind of look and address this main theme that if, I don't know if you can understand, I don't know if you heard it, but the main theme here is that, that God is the creator and God is intimately linked to his creation. And that's what the song is trying to say, trying to give us news that the one who created us, the one who created all things, is linked to all things. There isn't an accident. It isn't accidental. There's a purpose and a meaning behind creation because there is a creator who created creation. And so I want to look at five considerations over the next three hours. Um, We're going to look at the next... I'm just kidding. We will finish on time, I promise. But I want to kind of skate through a catalog of concise considerations. That's my alliteration for today. The first one is this. First thing to consider is that God created out of nothing. The song is trying to proclaim this, that God created everything out of nothing. The very first verse says, in the beginning, God created. The text uses the Hebrew verb. I don't know if you knew this, but the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. All right. I did take Hebrew a long time ago, but I still have to go look it up and and get the words. But the word uses the verb bara. In the beginning, God barad the heavens and the earth. In the Hebrew language, there's two main verbs for make or to create. One is asa, the other is bara. Okay, asa, this is when you make something from existing matter. So when you see the word asa in scripture, you see that God makes with the verb asa, and humans also make with the verb asa. Now, some of us humans make things better than other humans. Can we agree on that? Some people make things better than others. For example, we can take a tree which was created, it was barad by God, it was made, and we can take it and we can use it to break it down to make lumber, and then with that lumber, we can build a house. Someone asad this church building, all right? We all can take the things that are created and we can make something out of them. That is a saw. You might like this analogy a little bit better. A little bit later today, you guys are going to taste what was a sod. When someone took flour and they took oil and they took sugar and they, they mixed it together and then someone got the sprinkles, however you make sprinkles, however you a saw sprinkles and you add it to the top of the donut and we put it on the donut wall out there. We a sawed that donut wall for you because someone else a sawed those donuts that you were going to eat. But the whole idea is someone made those. They took existing matter and they formed them. So the correct way to think about us as human beings is we are not creators. Although YouTube wants to say, you're a content creator or whatever like that. No, we are creative because we were made in the image of a creator. We cannot make anything out of nothing because bara, that word bara means or carries the significance that it is created without analogy. In other words, there's nothing that came prior to from which God used as a blueprint to make human beings, to make everything. It says God created, God barad the heavens and the earth. Create without analogy. The word bara appears in verse 1 and verse 21 and verse 27. Three specific times it says God created. And the translation I read out of today said God made all throughout the text, but in those three accounts it switches to that word because the word is bara. God bara the heavens and the earth. Then in verse 21, God bara the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing which the waters team, according to their kind, God creates those. And then in verse 27, when it says, let us, it says, so God barad human beings in his own image. God, the creator, barad you, barad you. He created you without analogy. 
Now, I said this isn't a scientific book, but science, there's some scientific implications. We all know now that each person has their own genetic DNA code, that you are very individual. There's no one else just like you on this earth. Now, you have some of the same kind of properties as other human beings, but you are specific. You are intentional. God created you on purpose and for a purpose. Man, if our, if our culture could hear that story, like they are not the product of chance, the product of stars banging together. This is, no, God had created this perfect, like perfectly on purpose for a purpose. And that is what this song is trying to scream out. God created you out of nothing. God created all of this out of nothing. The second consideration is that God created by his spoken word. You ever notice it doesn't say that God took a hammer, took a nail and started pounding things? It doesn't say that God used his almighty muscle to stretch things out or to throw things. No, it says God spoke and God said, and it was so. The creative action of God here in this text is that God is a God who speaks and his creative power happens because he can speak things into existence. The creative action of God is one of speech. Seven times it says, let there be, or let there be light, let there be a vault or sky, let the water be gathered, let dry ground appear, let the land produce vegetation, let there be lights in the sky, let the water team, let birds fly, let the land produce living creatures and let us make man in our image. Seven times we hear that let there be and God said, and it was so. Isn't that amazing? The God who created you, who barraged you, with no other, any, with any, without anything to, to bring analogy next to it, he created you out of nothing. He does it by speaking. This is very different from the contemporaries of the time. So when Moses or maybe one of his students wrote this down, he's the writer, there were other stories circulating at that time. And one of them is the Babylonian myth called the Enuma Elish. And there it talks about the creation of the universe. But from that story, it says two gods were at war. One god defeated the other god and took the carcass of that god and spread it all out to make everything. That was a popular known myth of creation at the time. And here in this story, they're saying it didn't happen like that. He's connecting with a very similar story, but he's changing it. He's correcting it to, to say something different. No, this is the god who creates by speaking. This is the creator who has the power to create just with a spoken word. Let there be, and it was so. There's no wonder why then when Jesus comes, who is the creator God in human flesh, he redeems and recreates by speaking. You ever notice that in, all the story, in a lot of the stories of the gospel? Jesus will go and just say a word, and you will see new creation happen, recreation, redemption happen. I don't know if you remember this, but we're in the book of Mark. They're on the water, and Jesus is in the boat with his disciples and he's sleeping and a huge squall comes and starts to like ransack the boat and all the disciples are scared. This is a couple of years ago now. We started Mark a couple of years ago. And they looked and Jesus is sleeping and they go, Master, Master, wake up. We're gonna die. Look at the wind and the waves. And Jesus stands up and what does he do? Does he hit the water with, no. He gets up and he says, shut up and be still. Just be quiet, be still, but I like shut up. But he's not talking to the disciples who are scared, frantic. He's talking to the wind. He's talking to the waves. And what happens when he talks to the wind and the waves? They shut up and they die down. And there's no more storm on the Sea of Galilee. And the camera pans over to the disciples who are like, oh, who is this guy? Even the wind and the waves Obey his spoken word. There's another story in the Gospels. I love the stories in the Gospels. There's another story, a centurion who's like special forces in Rome's guard. And, and he shows up and he says, my servant is sick. And Jesus goes, well, where do you live? He goes, no, no, no. I, don't, I, I, I understand authority. I know all you have to do is say the word and my servant will be well. Jesus goes, wow, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. So Jesus speaks a word, doesn't go to the house, and the centurion's servant is healed just by the spoken word. Or there's another story, and I love it because my boys were acting it out a few years ago because they watched the storybook, which is a, 
you know, it's a cartoon of stories of Jesus with a robot. I know theologically it doesn't really match, but the stories are good, all right? But these kids go back in time to see stories of Jesus. And my kids used to act out the scene when Lazarus was dead and Mary and Martha are mourning him and they've put him into the tomb. And all of a sudden Jesus shows up and he cries with them because he's hurt because his friend died. He moved with compassion. But then he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And he stands up and he says, Lazarus, come out. Maybe he just says, hey, Lazarus, let's go, man. We got to go. I don't know how he says it. But I imagine him saying, Lazarus, come out. And I love it because my boys used to cover with, like one would cover himself with a sheet and the other one would go, Lazarus, come out. And he'd walk out with the sheet and he's like, oh. It's funny. Fun times, right? At the spoken word, a dead man comes back to life and walks out of a grave. And Jesus says, take off his grave clothes. Like, he's not dead. We got some time left with this guy. This gives us hope for the future, that Jesus, the one who can speak a word and bring redemption and recreation, that one day in the future, like Daniel shared last week, he will speak and all things will be renewed and remade. And he does it by the power of his spoken word. God, the creator, creates by speaking. The third consideration is God created in his own divine order and time. God created in his own divine order and time. Chapter 1, verse 2 says this, Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the forces of the water, or over the waters. When it says formless and empty, those are two Hebrew words. They're kind of silly to say, but it's tohu and bohu. All right? It's like everything was tohu vabohu. That's what it says in Hebrew, tohu and bohu. And those words, we don't really have any good English translations, so the best we've come up with is it's formless and it's void, or it's formless and it's empty. And the way God creates, he creates in this kind of uh, order that kind of presents itself in two rows. And I gave you guys a diagram in church today. Okay, a little object lesson for all of you. Here's the slide. On the top, you see day one and day two and day three, he moves from formlessness to form. In day four and day five and day six, he moves from emptiness to fullness. That's how it's explained here in Genesis chapter one. That's the proclamation that God moves from formless to form and from empty to fullness. Here's the next slide. In day one, he creates light. In day two, he creates firmament, or you see the sky separated out and it makes sky. In day three, he creates dry land and vegetation. On day four, then he does what? He fills what he created on day one. It's the way he goes back to day one and he fills it. So he he makes the lights and he calls them the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. And he also set the stars in place. Now, the interesting thing about this passage is he doesn't say the word sun and he doesn't say the word moon because the ancient peoples would worship the sun. He's saying, no, you don't worship the sun, even though it produces a lot of energy, it heats up a bunch of stuff. Like it is a great, powerful thing, but actually there was a creator who put it into place. And it's just a greater light that governs the day, the lesser light governs the night, but there's a creator who put it there. And day five, we see the birds and the fish God there does a blessing as well, right? He blesses the birds. We drove back from, uh, from Nevada. We saw a couple of bald eagles. I was super stoked. Those are really cool looking birds. All right, I can't eat fish, but I hear the salmon's amazing out there, right? God blesses birds and fish, all right? And then in day six, living creatures and human beings. So if you think about it, day one, two, and three, God like builds the house. Here's an analogy. I'm going to steal it. God builds the house. And then day four, five, and six, he furnishes it. God creates in his own way, in his own order. We see it there, the way it's presented. We also say, though, that he also creates in his own time. There's a, there's a pattern there, if you notice. There was evening, and there was morning, and then the number of days shows up. There's also a ton of sevens within this text. And if you want to do some more research and stuff, I can give you a resource to look at. But there's a bunch of different ways the multiples of sevens show up here in the text. And we know that seven in a Bible term is 
the number represents completeness or wholeness. And this is a way just to say God completes or he creates in his complete way, in his complete time, however he sees fit. I think that's one way to look at this section. God creates in his own order and his own time. But the point is, because sometimes we can get lost in how long did it take and what are those days, actual days and all those. The real thing we need to focus on is that God is the one who created Because if he is the creator, then there's hope for us to be recreated after death. Number four, the fourth consideration, we will get out on time, I promise, is that God created a creation that is good. There's a verdict that God pronounces over creation day in and day out, except for day two. We'll talk about that in a second. God saw that it was good. God can speak everything into existence and God can see what he made. He goes, man, that is, that's good. So much so that at the very end when he stopped, not rested, he actually stopped from creating. He didn't have to create anymore. He stopped and he goes, man, that is very good. In its original creation, everything was made good. I know that we don't see that all the time. I know that we constantly are battling the effects of sin because Genesis 2 through 11 will Explain to us why the world isn't the original good condition that God made it. We'll see what happened, right? We know that. We know that there's issues in relationships. There's issues in politics. There's illness. There's sickness. There's things that hit us as human beings that would, that would beg to differ with the, with the status that everything is good, right? They're contradictory to this idea that creation is good. But when God looks at creation, he sees a good creation, so good, that he's willing to take on human flesh and die for human beings to redeem them and be back in right relationship after we have fallen from grace. God saw that it was good, so much so that it was very good. And the fifth consideration is that God created a creature in his likeness and in his image or in his image and likeness. That's what we get when we get to the very end of Genesis chapter 1. It says, let us make human beings or let us make mankind in our image. In the image and likeness of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So God has created a lot of things, right? The sky and the waters and the birds and the fish and the livestock and all those wild animals, all according to their kinds. And then God finally goes, let's let's make a creature that is going to reflect our image on earth. That's going to to be our presence, if you will, to be little temples, little sanctuaries that carry our image in this world. And God does that because he creates human beings on purpose for a purpose. But we're going to talk about that a little bit more next week. Let's pray as we finish today. God, as we look at this first portion of scripture, we can't help but join with the song to sing your praises. God, you're so amazing. It's so great to know that you created and you created on purpose for a purpose. That means nobody in this room is an accident, God. Nobody in this room was outside of your mind when you created us. Lord, help us to see that reality. Help us to believe that, God. That in the beginning, you created. Because it was you who created, you are linked to us. And that is good news for us to take home. That we were made by someone who loves us and cares for us. God, help us to live that up, live that out in our daily lives. May that message change us, Lord to sing your praises a little bit louder. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, that concludes the first part of our little series. On your way out today, I want to remind you that we have some pastoral partners who will be up front and would love to pray for you. If there's something maybe in the new year as you're embarking on a couple new things, maybe you want some prayer for the journey, come on up and receive prayer. These are people who deeply care about our church and give time to pray and to walk alongside of us. Also, there's out in the Connect Hub, there's a place to grab the 21 Days of Prayer and Fasting Guide. It gives you scriptures to walk through. It gives you a place to take notes and stuff like that. We've provided some of them out there for you. 
Or you can, like everybody else, go out and enjoy a donut that was a sod for you. All right. And I don't know, just have a sprinkle or two. I don't know. Happy New Year, guys. We'll see you next week.